Hello and welcome everybody to the To The Point information session Q&A session. Thank you so much for those of you who are here live and for those of you taking the time to watch the replay. Thank you also for that. For today, I've got a little agenda of what we're going to, what I'm going to go through uh, sort of in a nice organized way. I've got a PowerPoint that I'm going to share in just a few moments and you'll see there, of course, the whole point of this is to have questions. But prior to that, perhaps I will be able to lay out the program with enough details that it um, makes sense to you. But of course, if you still have a question, that's what we're meeting here for. I have to say, I'm actually very excited about this course. It's been many years in the making. I um, do a lot of sub-teaching and even kids just a month ago going, have you finished writing your book? Because I guess I was talking about it a few years ago. And, and I go, actually, no. no. You know, and I feel a bit like I didn't get off my butt and say what I was going to do. But it's because COVID taught me that actually, maybe I'm not supposed to be writing a book and dealing with publishers and all this stuff. Maybe it just needs to be an online course that is actually more accessible and maybe more um, usable than that average 12 year old going out and getting a book that they're going to read. So I have been writing the book and now putting it into a course for quite some time. And while COVID was a, a scar on society that we will see the remnants of certainly throughout our lifetime, I'm sort of the look on the sunny side of things person as well and go, it did allow many people to embrace begrudgingly in the beginning, but perhaps eventually embrace that there is some merit to online learning. And when I got my poof of insight, uh, that's when I went, yes, it needs to be a course more than a book. Maybe it's a book someday. I don't know. I'm a book person. I've got shelves upon shelves here. Uh, but the average teenage dancer is probably less likely to be a book person than a online course person. And the actual financial model, which we'll get to, which I know you're absolutely interested in, that also came about from COVID, actually. I was a studio owner myself from 1999 to 2009. And at that point, my rent. Well, by the time I finished my rent, I'm here in the Vancouver area, was $8,000 a month. I can't even imagine what it would be now, 14 years later. So summers were really hard for me back then. And, you know, you're paying your rent, even though there's not a lot of people in the, the building. And I know that a course like this, where there's some ability to make extra income in this way without the the scooping in of all the people and the organizing the, the precious hours of space and the schedule and all that would have been a godsend. So when I started to think about doing it online and realized that honestly, there could be many, many people, there could be dozens, there could be hundreds that might take it around the world. And while I'd like to make some money and, and have a lifestyle that's comfortable, that does not mean that I need to say to um, share with thousands of people and become a millionaire. I would rather see the dance industry survive. And there's a lot of people that didn't survive COVID. A lot of studios that shut down, a lot of studios that combined with others, and a lot that I personally know that they're still struggling to recover. And that's when I had the idea of going, well, why don't I just share? Just share and do a, like a profit sharing model saying, you get to uh, buy the course, at the wholesale price, like my price to you, and you sell it for whatever you want. You can add 20 bucks, you could add 200 bucks. I don't know, you know your market. So we'll get to that a bit more in the financial model discussion. But I should say right ahead, that's why I got into it as I'm like, if the online world can be the world, there's a potential for a lot of sales. But I'm willing to completely share that. And that's where the so now you know it's now online and this profit month. That's the part that I think is um, unique and new. But I hope that many other people who create um, online courses perhaps adopt this model. I think it could be a, a really beautiful thing for us all. So with that, I'm going to start my um, screen share. All right. And so for the outline for today, I'll look at and share with you what I consider the benefits for everybody. That means teachers and studio owners. Please note, I'm speaking a little bit more for studio owners because they're the ones that have the financial burden. Um, although as a teacher, I actually lost my job during COVID where the um, studio owner said, 
I can do the classes that you're doing and I just need to. So I am speaking for teachers as well. And if you're a teacher watching this and want to be part of this course, please bring it to your studio owner, okay? Because it's actually designed a little bit more as a model for studio owners to share with their students and their teachers. So whichever one your studios or teachers, it is for both, just please teachers, bring it to your studio. So, uh, and then parents and of course the students. We'll go over what the course structure is so you get a bit more understanding of it. The elements in the course, kind of like a light overview of the course content, uh, some of the fun strategies that I'm using. And that would be where we get to actually do a few little things that you, if uh, depending on where you heard about this, you might've been on the email list where you saw the picture of the girl with the sponges, or I mentioned something about telling you a bit more about Achilles stripping. So I will share with you a few actual takeaways that you can use right away. And sort of like as a, see, these are some cool things that I do. And as a thank you for watching this. Then of course the financial model, so you can understand that. And then what next steps would be and then any questions that you have. So I call it a win cycle. When everybody, everybody wins, everybody gets a benefit. Everybody gets something that they want. And I'm, open to more suggestions, but I have been thinking for quite a while on how can it be created in a way that everybody in that cycle feels like they're getting a win and that there's certainly no reason why not to do this. In order to make sure that the mind shatter in the back of like, oh, I'm watching a webinar and there's going to be a pitch at the end and she's going to ask for money and you know, and, and I know I've been on many of those and it's always in the back of my mind. And so I'm watching the whole thing, wondering what the money piece is going to be. So I'll just say right away, because of the way the model is, of if you're a studio owner, you are selling it to your students. That means you never spend a dime. You will not be buying the course from me or the access to the course unless a student has bought it. So there's no money out of your pocket. I'm not asking for money from you at all. So in a way, this is a pitch, but it is a pitch to, hey, maybe you want to sell this to your students, all right? So there's nothing for you to worry about with um, needing to put out money. The only thing that might be different is if you decide to pay in one lump sum, but charge them over time. I guess there's a bit of an investment there and that you would decide what's right for your student studio. Okay, so you can rest easy. You're not going to be judging that. You're going to be judging the value, I guess, for your students. So huh, the elephant in the room, are there actual benefits to online? Um, and perhaps, I'm sure, go ahead, put up your hand if you hated teaching online. And probably did. Yeah. yeah. So most of us begrud begrudgingly went there. And I think we were willing to go there also because in the beginning, we thought it would be very short term. You're like, okay, I can suck it up for four weeks. Oh, I can suck it up for eight weeks. Oh, I'm going to have to finish the year like this. I had students that were working towards an exam that never happened. Right? Yeah. But So if you have an aversion to teaching online, great. Don't worry about it. You are not the one that needs to teach online. <laughs> I'm the one doing it. So, uh, you know, we all, we get our little lenses of how we feel about something. So your I hate teaching online, don't worry about it. You can take those glasses off and go, but maybe my students don't mind or can have some benefit to, teach, to learning online. So set that aside, clearing the way to let these new ideas come in. Because as a matter of fact, I actually think that online learning is perfect for certain subjects. The online learning model that you'll see, the accountability. So if we're dealing with having students gain more strength, that's gonna be about consistency. So if you get an email where your new lesson is here and it's, it's kind of like tapping you on the shoulder every single day to go do it. It's a great way to be accountable. That's a little different than, you know, you see them on a Tuesday and you ask them to practice something between now and next Tuesday. You're not there to, not, to tap them on the shoulder to go, hey, remember to go do that? Sure, you might see students many days in a week, but you might not. And each class that you teach has sort of a different agenda of what you're working on. So you're probably not reminding them of that thing on Tuesday, on Friday to practice. 
an online thing that kind of keeps delivering. It's almost, let's be honest, kind of like spoon feeding, saying, here, another little dose, take your little dose, take your little dose. That can be really good for daily practice. And I can tell you, I've been learning Italian. I'm very inspired to go see Italy. And so I thought, well, I'm going to start sending the message to the universe and start learning some Italian just on Duolingo. I think my like 70 day, 90 day streaks happen because Duolingo reminds me every day, hey, have you got three minutes? <laughs> and yeah, I do. And so even if I just see the email, I go do it. It's only three minutes. I give myself a pat on the back for, for doing it. So this has some of that structure involved as well, which is why online can be so good for this. Another piece that'll be part of this course is a lot of self-assessment and reflection on how they're doing and as part of the self-assessment. Students ideally do self-assessment, but self-assessment in class is sometimes a, a brain state that there's too much going on, it's moving too fast in class, but to actually stop and think and have time at home and in privacy to take the time to do that, I don't think you can do that necessarily in class. I've been part of classes as an adult where we do like little writing reflection stuff and we're given five minutes for doing that. I think adults can drop into that, but I'll also tell you some adults can't drop into it. Sometimes I can't drop into that moment and maybe they gave us five minutes, five precious minutes of in-studio space um, where I wanted to keep moving instead. Or I really was in a greatly, deeply reflective mood and I would have wanted 15 minutes. So it kind of, when you're going into that deeper thinking, reflective place, being online, you can take as long as you need or as little as you need. Uh, guidance for goal setting. Again, that's a similar thing. I've got to actually think for myself. We can't adopt other people's goals. We got to be ours. I don't know that, again, a 12-year-old would um, think of their own personal goal. I think there's peer pressure. There's somebody was brave and put up their hand and shared their goal. And then everybody copies that same goal. It might have been their goal, but it might be more like, oh, I feel pressure to have an answer. When you're at home, looking at your screen, finishing something just for you, it's going to be just for you. And we don't really strive for our goals unless they actually are our goals. So online's perfect for that. And that kind of is the same as the personal development skills, which I've just made as a big umbrella term. There's a lot in there. When I think of, again, online and particularly um, dancers moving, say, towards point work, that maturity and responsibility pieces really have to be there in place. You know, I would never put a dancer on point who kind of is a goofball in class. You're not ready because you are not going to be a goofball on point, not on my watch. So there's a lot there. And I think, again, <laughs> going back to COVID, we know that a lot of social emotional skills kind of got stunted because a lot of that gets developed interaction with others. So I'm going to do my best to try to help fill in some of those pieces that maybe parents aren't doing, they didn't realize they need to do it, or those chunk of time missing thanks to COVID, we really need it. Or even just, let's get rid of the parents of today or COVID and say, you know, a 12-year-old going on point probably needs to be able to drop into a more mature state than a, uh, the 12-year-old the that they can be at school or playing with their friends or something like that, right? They need to know how to get into that place. Anatomical knowledge. Yeah, you might want to move around and touch, but um, where you could put your hands on, but there's a lot more self-discovery if it's being taught here and you've got to find it for yourself. You build your body map better when you found it. And of course, there's even just learning the names and all that fun stuff. I say it's fun stuff. I nerd out on it. That doesn't need to take class time, nor does the fun stuff. I've already made some crossword puzzles and word searches, you know, where it's got like medial, maniolus, tibia, fun stuff like that. A fun way to learn these things that we want our students to know. But do we always use the precious in-studio time? Perhaps not. And then the final one is the guidance and prompting for effective practice skills. And that kind of goes back to the accountability of daily practice, the how to practice. I know when I look at students, I actually you know, did this very recently where I'm like, okay, I'm giving you 10 minutes. Show me how you would warm up backstage, you know, say for the recital. And you watch them and 
students of many ages are a little dumbfounded. They're actually not quite sure how to practice or warm up just on their own. Because of course, as teachers, we're in the room. We can't help ourselves. We're always guiding. We're always leading. That feels like who we are when we're there. This um, effective practice skills, though, being fed as information and then cycling back to reflective, it's going to give them the skills that it might make it now that they have their own practice. And my hope for all of you out there that do exams and competitions is that the students taking a program like this, the practice skills of not just these exercises and whatnot, that it becomes part of who they are and it actually, you know, bleeds out to everything. And they are now students who actually practice in an effective way. That's the goal. So who is this course for? I'm going to say students 10 and up. If you really wanted to lobby for a nine-year-old that you think is mature, okay. <laughs> but I, I, I'm pushing the maturity stuff and a lot of the understanding. Students who are part of your competitive program, for sure, would benefit from this. Clearly, students who take ballet exams, I happen to be RAD, but any syllabus. Students wishing to start point. You could potentially make this almost a prerequisite or a mandatory class to say you're not taking point until you've gone through this for the actual understanding and strength, as well as the maturity development. And therefore, let's point out here that to the points, I've done pictures that show like point work and whatnot, but really it's about feet. So that means that it could be any genre actually that uses the, the pointed foot. So maybe your hip hop and tappers are gonna go, nah, I don't need this. But if you've got a very serious contemporary program, this would still benefit them. And then just very short about why me, why would you trust me to create and teach this course? Some of you, of course, have been part of the Radiant Dance Teacher Facebook group or received the emails. Maybe you've checked out a lot of the videos on the YouTube channel, but still you don't fully know me. So my really short version, because you're not here to just hear about me, is yes, okay, I've been teaching ballet for 35 years. I'm an RAD teacher. I went to college. I did my anatomy classes there. I've had the great pleasure of, since 1999, with the exclusion of the COVID years, being able to study at the Bill Evans Teachers Intensives, where a teacher by the name of Kitty Daniels has been teaching anatomy. And I've had anatomy year after year after year. And um, year after year means that also I come in and go, I have questions to elevate us from what we did last year. And then, so we just, I keep developing it. It's been a personal insight of mine back when I was 18 and wanting to get into the, what was the CBTS program, but back then <laughs> I had to do correspondence courses. It wasn't online back in 1988. And I could choose to do history or anatomy. Ultimately I did both. So I did an anatomy course as a correspondence course where I had to drive to someone's home to do the final exam. <laughs> so anatomy has been something that I've been interested in for a long time. I've also done my level one Franklin method where that was very, well, it's embodied anatomy imagery. Highly recommend it. I'm also a brain gym instructor and touch for health. And uh, most importantly that, that I draw on in here is the developmental movement patterns and reflex work. That's part of my certification in the brain gym world, although a separate one that I'm certified in Blomberg rhythmic movement training, which is the reflexes and the developmental movement part patterns. I'm a certified Evans teacher and he teaches lab on and that's what that is. So I've been studying this out of actually personal interest as a teacher, but also my own body. When I was 10, I had a traumatic ankle injury. I was jumping rope out on the playground the rope caught my ankle and I jumped on my ankle. So I crushed the bone. I got a bone chip in there. I needed surgeries to remove the bone. Unsuccessful because I had pulverized the little bone chip. Anyway, at 24 after the second surgery, they told me to get a desk job that I've destroyed my ankle and I shouldn't be a dance teacher. And that was like a month after I got my dance degree. So <laughs> I clearly ignored them, but set on a journey to understand all I could in particular about regaining the arch in my left foot. I did not want to wear orthotics for the rest of my life. And I thought that wearing orthotics, not teaching and then, or sorry, orthotics while I wasn't teaching and then not wearing them when I was teaching was just gonna be very confusing for my body. And thankfully in my early thirties, I had a Feldenkrais session, another wonderful thing I recommend where 
I got up off the table and took a plie of equal depth that I had not had in like 15 years. I thought that the cartilage had worn away so much I couldn't actually bend fully anymore. And as it turned out, it was actually just all holding and protecting patterns from the injury and the surgeries. That started me on my journey. And now at 53, I'm happy to say my plie is pretty much even and my arch is almost back fully to match. And that's all been stuff that I've been learning and working. So when I see students who have flat feet, it's not a life sentence. You can change it. That's my reflex work. When I see students have high arches that are inherently unstable, that's not just typical strengthening. That's the reflex work again. So I, I really believe I've got some unique things to share. And then along with that, all the personal development pieces going in there. Um, I've been told to write my life story because I've had quite the, um, the drama and traumas in my life and rebounded out of all of them. So I have been studying various personal development stuff for, well, most of my life. So I'm drawing from all of that and I'm an avid reader. So I kind of feel like I'm doing the work that many of you might want to do. So the book Atomic Habits, for example, that many people like and love, I'm applying that to our dancers. I'm taking the time to do that and show them how to have their own version of that for dancers. Okay. So enough about me. Oh, well, here's sort of the, yeah, <laughs> I guess a little bit more about me. The part that's really interesting, uh, the reason I called it Beyond Exercises is there's actually a lot of great already um, courses out there, like the work of Lisa Howell, for example, or PBT, that's great for strengthening. My understanding, however, from my investigation to those is that the, the complementary training that I've had, they, at this point, do not have. So the developmental movement patterns, and the coordination of the full kinetic chains, the um, reflex integration work. The, and another big one is in my brain gym, looking at when I can trigger full integration of the brain, that triggers the ability to get to the deepest muscles of the feet that require the sort of 3D movement. 3D movement requires good integration of the brain. So that's something that I can bring beyond sort of what I'd call typical exercises, which quite frankly, most of you teachers watching this probably know and do. So I'm adding a new element. And then here's just a little bit more now back to the actual training. I'll say this course will be available for one year after your time of registration. Okay, so that students, you, the students, teachers can go back to it over and over and perhaps, you know, you do the first watch all the way through and then you, maybe you decide to do it again. Students could be coached to do that or just, you know, they can do it on their own. Okay. So that's one thing is that it's like an evergreen thing, you know, versus I taught this on Tuesday and that Tuesday is forever gone. Okay, right? can keep repeating it. So this is not meant to be as a replacement to any class. It's meant to be as a supplement to in-person work where you can go at your own pace. And this phrase here, high challenge with low threat. What that means is that I can supply the students with things that are challenging that could be in class, in a sense, threatening, meaning that everybody's seeing that you're struggling with it. And that act of struggling with witnesses is embarrassing. I mean, they shut down and it, they actually are gonna learn less when they're in that state. The benefit of privacy would mean they can sort of wrestle through and struggle through it on their own and to keep reviewing to get more help. So the safety of the home environment, I think is something we, we need to be aware of. There's the idea of spreading out in space that. And again, having the support and the peers and the fun of that and the teacher's eyes, all of that is great. Use that, let that be how you are in studio and then let them have their at home time to drop in a bit more personally and work on the stuff that requires that privacy. So again, easy for review. They can pause to learn and therefore absorb fully. I'm sure for those of you who still take classes on your own, there'd be times where you're like, you, you, if you could hit the pause button on the teacher, you'd want to and just say, wait, let me try that. Oh, hang on, rewind 30 seconds. What did you just say? Let me try it again. And a lot of students are not brave enough to put up their hand in class and go, I was paying attention. Really, I was, but I still need you to repeat what you just said. Okay. So this gives them that opportunity. Just go back. It's fine. 
And of course, the other beautiful thing is they can't miss a class, right? It's not the old, uh, I know as a teacher, if I know I'm teaching something like really profound, that's like foundational, that everything's going to spring out from, I don't do it when there's kids away. So I'm like, oh, that, that moment in time will never come back. So let's do the big foundational stuff when everybody's there. Don't need to worry about that with this. Now, benefits for the student owner. Well, increased income without increased work when you need it most. So I am talking to Northern Hemisphere people. I realize that. So I guess you reverse the dates a little bit if you're somebody down under, New Zealand, Australia. The opportunity for increased student retention. And the reason I say student retention is there's a lot of students that do like that studio hopping, sort of the grass is always greener. Well, maybe offering something new and unique and showing that you're like very 2023 by <laughs> using the technology of today. Um, they might go, oh, the grass is green here. Look, my studio has this, this studio doesn't. I'm gonna stay here for access to this. By using an online one, you don't need to worry about scheduling teachers. That's me, it's already done. And you don't need to worry about the space or using up prime space. My hope would be by the end of the, the program, there's a transformation with the students for improved maturity, motivation, and respect, making your life easier every day. You can support teachers. This is CPD work for teachers, for those that need that. There can be parent education during that transition to point work. Um, I'm not sure yet. I, I'm open to feedback on whether there should be any sort of lessons that go directly to the teacher to say to support your child or sort of as an FYI, this is what we're working on. I'm open to feedback on that and I can add those in. And it enables students to become more serious for those that want to. And that way makes your program perhaps a little bit more robust. If you, again, if you're a studio owner, it's kind of a fun wordplay thing to go, but it's actually more than that, right? To go from surviving and just keeping going to thriving. My studio survived for 10 years and I'm going to say survived. I never thrived. Maybe I had too big a space for the number of students. I don't know. The year I opened, I thought I was ready to go. Five studios all opened in the same year in the same area. I think we all, I guess, saw the same opportunity. <laughs> oh, and only one of them still going. Yeah. And it's not me, but that's a whole nother story. So let's, I'm willing to help you go from surviving to thriving. And that, let's be honest, means money, right? Increased profit. <laughs> if I knew I was bringing home more money every, it would lower stress in many areas. It kind of means it's a little easier to put up with some of the, the hardships of teaching and running a studio. And then you go, at least I'm paid well for it. Okay, now the benefits for your dance teachers, whether you're the teacher bringing this to the studio, owner or whether it is um, studio owner knowing that you want to get teachers who are loyal because you treat them really well. If they are RAD like me, and I guess many of the other syllabus they need to do, they continue in professional development. This would be about 20 hours worth of professional development. So that could be their whole year right there by being a teacher that learns alongside. They would be monitoring and being part of it, making sure the students are doing it. And I'll share more about that but they don't have to create it or really do the work. Their brain space is freer. So they're like learning without the challenge of having to pay for the CPD themselves and having to do all the work. They're also gonna get that daily little nudge, sort of the progressional drip layers of information. So it makes it easier for them to keep learning and growing. The other thing that I like about it, I'll be again, sort of honest here is some teachers are young teachers and they're good, but they really do need some more information. And it's pretty awkward to say as a studio owner, honey, you're good, but you gotta learn more. By bringing this to your students, you're helping to educate the teachers as well, but not in a way that felt um, threatening or demoralizing to hear that you need more training. Okay? And of course the students, the teachers will get the students who are daily more mature, motivated, and of course, stronger. There are Q and A sessions, so the teachers will get their questions answered as well. Benefits for parents. If this is for people that are transitioning to point, hopefully this would mean then they can go, my child has been through a program that is all about use of feet and understanding and therefore safety to be able to go on point. There's accountability. They're gonna know if this is not, 
that I bought a course and how do I know my kid ever did it? There's accountability built into it. I'll share more about that. They can add a class to their child's training and they don't need to worry about more scheduling, driving times and organizing their life to make it happen. So they're like, you want me to add an extra class just for money? No driving, no scheduling? Okay, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Okay, um, and also the holistic training that crosses over beyond ballet classes I hope parents are interested in this. They may or may not be. That's up to you whether you want to share that sort of the personal development side of it. Maybe you're going to focus on the safety side of it. That, that's up to you. But I think a lot of parents would like to know that their kid is going to get that, that goal setting and the motivation, intrinsic motivation support. No missed classes means that the investment that they've made is fully used. If I was a parent and my kid got sick and missed two weeks of classes, it would eat at me that I paid for two weeks of classes that were never taken. That's me. Don't know how your parents feel. And then, of course, the support to help support them to help their student, their child, rather, to become uh, more responsible, which takes less pressure. It's less pressure on them to be the responsible one. Okay, so now the actual course structure. I've got 42 lessons that can be delivered in two different formats. And the 42 came from, um, those of you that are Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fans, it didn't come from that. I just think it's funny because if you know that movie, the answer is always 42. Yeah, the meaning of life is 42. Anyway, it's a little joke for some of you. <laughs> the reason 42 came about was looking at starting September 11th to December 15th and being a beginning of season, Northern Hemisphere beginning of season course that is done before they're transitioning into the heavy sort of competition exam time and therefore could be really good foundation for the year. So that wound up being 14 weeks of a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. If you wanted to compress it into eight weeks, it could be a Monday through Friday and they would get the same number of lessons just in a compressed time frame. So you can decide which one you want. There is a certificate at the end for people who want it. That would be then for the teachers. They would definitely need that. That would show the CPD hours. So it can be delivered in one of two formats. You can decide. Uh, I'm even going to say within a studio, the students can decide which format they want. Maybe. I don't know if that's asking for trouble that people, some people are on the eight weeks, some people are on the 14 week. You can decide or decide with your teachers. Um, so the key features of it is really that I'd want them to actually do it. So I, there's the, the, di, the, um, the, say the daily lessons of three times a week or Monday to Friday, and they're all in going to be probably like a 15 to 30 minute. Depends how fast you read, but they're going to be a combination of text and of course, videos, training videos, exercise videos, new idea videos, or it might be cueing them on some self-awareness, self-assessment stuff. But I'm dividing them into digestible little pieces so that they're never overwhelmed with too much at one time. Then the big piece would be, again, are they actually doing it? There's some statistic out there that's like 95% of people who buy a course never do it. That's ridiculous, that's crazy. Um, and that's not what I want. I don't wanna just say, oh, I've collected your money, I don't care if you do it. I really care if you do it because I'm out to support the dance world. So how are we gonna make that happen? Well, there's an accountability design. Every Friday, there'd be a little quiz based on the content from the week. Not really hard quiz, but we definitely have to have watched it. And with a 75% pass rate, that means, boom, now you get to unlock the next week's content. So it's kind of saying you can't just pop and skip all through it. You actually are gonna be doing it. And the cool piece as well with that is that the the quizzes, um, unfortunately on the Kajabi platform that I'm using, you can't actually get the percentage that the student got, but you can be notified like a, a report every week on who's actually completed. So teachers will be notified. And then let's say there's some kid that's three weeks behind and you know it wasn't that they were sick for two weeks. There can be the gentle, hey, are you actually on week six? We're all on week six, so are you there? The other piece there, community. Rather than doing a Facebook group, 
which I know many teenagers are not on. I know the teachers probably are. So yeah, the community is there for them to share, ask questions, maybe post their wins or their progress or whatever. We'll see how much they want to use it. But in a really perfect world, I'd love it if they even didn't just connect with their fellow studio dancers doing it, but with, you know, they made friends with, you know, a kid down in Australia who's also doing it. Wouldn't that be cool if the, the network actually got to the, um, yeah, almost like pen pals, but you're like foot pals and you're all sharing about that. And then, of course, there's the live um, Q&A monthly that um, I'm looking at right now having one a week that's a different time zone, realizing that time zones around the world are a thing. So there'd be like a West Coast, East Coast, Europe, Australia each different week so that ideally there can be the chance for a live one and you would of course receive the replays regardless of whether you attended live you'd still get the replays there we go okay the accountability structure i did mention about this again so again the yes, student you cannot pass without oh so actually we already shared that there will be many checklists throughout that each week are updated based on the new information that came out that week they can track their progress and they can track their, their practicing. And I would hope then, well, I would even point out, of course, in another lesson going, are you noticing your progress is directly related to your practice? Oh, what a concept, cause and effect. The kids don't always seem to get that one. So there's the live Q&A that you get to ask your questions all the time. There's two programs that I have. I'll explain more on the financial model in just a moment that there's the RISE group and then the Relevate group. The RISE group would be Q&A with everybody who can come at that time. The Relevate, you have the option of making it where it's just your studio and your teachers. So you really get that private one-on-one -on -one time with me. So now a little bit more about the course content. Of course, there's going to be a strengthening element, but I've taken it beyond just strength. And there's a few outlines about what it, I'm talking about. Strength seems obvious, but I'm going to get into the muscle balancing, which is important for um, safety, injury prevention. 3D and spirals, that stuff's not talked about a lot, but the body's actually designed in a spiral pattern and spiral absorption. Stamina, and what I mean by that is that we learn our compensation patterns when we're getting fatigued and we learn how to stay just below our fatigue point that would trigger compensations. So things like if you're doing your rises, are you now, um, you know, you're getting fatigued and you keep going, but you're clenching your jaw. Wait a minute, that we need to, let's not go there because that's actually not helping them. Sensitivity, looking at proprioception, I'd put in vestibular as well. That would be like your balance system and working on micro movements so that you are able to constantly make those little adjustments to remain safe. Whether you're on demi point, let's say you're the contemporary dancer or on point, as the ballet dancer. Stretching and mobility parts, the form. Um, I actually, there's a video, I think already on YouTube, a little bit more about the, the reaching of the foot and the 3D point. The function, uh, a lot of dancers, we know we're not gonna roll, but we do need to have functional and useful pronation and supination happening all the time. Lots of techniques on how to release the ankles, the arches and the toes. That's a little bit more of my reflex work actually. Tension is often a sign of an active reflex that's just holding the body hostage. And I came up with this. I guess, uh, you know, this lesson is brought to you by the letter S. <laughs> so I'm part of my um, uh, a lesson that's going to have a strengthening component versus, say, a personal development one would be we're going to do the squish, which is about the mobility of the foot, like that it can change and move around. The sensitivity, all the micro movements, we do that first. Then we do some strengthening. We start looking at whether stamina is being developed appropriately. And then at the end of all that work, we do the stretching. So it'll be well thought out for them so that they're not just at home randomly going, I guess I'll do some releves and rises. So, well, actually there's a, a really nice process. And teachers, of course, could choose to use this in class if they wish as well. Foundational principles that will be there as well. Helping with the coordination and learning like basic movement principles, uh, which kind of links in with kinetic chains. A lot of times dancers are dealing more with um, coordination issues than actually a strength issue. So we look at that, the functional anatomy, and there'd be some imagery in there. Um, phone rang. <laughs> okay, uh, moving along here, self-assessment, looking at your strengths and I dare say weaknesses, but that's the right word, I suppose. 
your readiness for moving if this was specifically for point people, understanding your practice habits. Then this is the part where I'd say my background really shines, the brain integration part for the coordination and the learning, being in a learning state before you go and get into the strengthening. Reflex integration, I already mentioned about that. And I've even done something called vision gym. And yes, I'm still wearing glasses, but my, <laughs> my vision gym teacher no longer wears glasses. So I'm being um, inspired and I'm working on it. And it's quite profound work for everybody. So maybe one day you'll see me without glasses as well. So the vision and vestibular training working together to give students really amazing stability and balance. Again, whether you're on point or a, a lyrical dancer on demi point. And it's those pieces that tend to fall away when it really counts in an exam, competition, audition. So the brain integration part will be linked in there to help them to manage the stress when it counts and not lose your balance or grounding just because you're a little stressed with a performance. And confidence building. Many of you, I'm sure, know the value of visualization, but do we get to take valuable class time to work on that? Probably not, but wouldn't it be cool if they still learned how to do that? Lots of good imagery stuff and noticing skills and self-awareness. You may find students taking this course need less corrections because they're monitoring themselves at a higher level. That would be a, a major goal of mine. Now onto the financial model. Okay, I already mentioned this one at the beginning to say, mm, you don't need to worry about thinking that I'm asking for money from you. This will be about you asking for money from the parents to have your students enrolled in this. So it's a very basic model, but it's not like a, I'm buying a t-shirt and selling it. So you don't need to buy 50 t-shirts to get a good wholesale price <laughs> and then just sit on them. Uh, when I closed my studio, I had bags, bags, grocery or like garbage bags full of studio logo clothing that I still have sitting in my office. Thankfully, I found out about um, a, yeah, a child's um, clothing store that donates bags of clothing to Australia, or not, sorry, Australia, Africa. So I got a discount there and got a friend's kids some clothes and sent off my three bags of Prism Dance, where that was my studio, Prism Dance Center um, to Africa. So. I'm, I'm marketing for a studio in Africa that doesn't exist. So I know all about buying, buying stuff and sitting on it and going, I made the investment and I'm hoping this doesn't need to happen, but it still has the same model of wholesale price to market price. So that's where you'd make the profit. Um, and I'll share with you in just a moment, the wholesale price or the bulk pricing when you actually do have say more than 20 students. And then you selling for the profit that whatever is appropriate for your studio. Okay. so. Here's a basic price. Um, there's models for discounts in just a moment, but if the course is $197 for 42 lessons, that's about $5 a lesson. Maybe you go, I can market that easily to sell it's $10 a lesson, and that's still way under probably what a in-studio class lesson is. Well, there's the math. Wouldn't that be lovely to have an extra $4,000, particularly, say, during August, July and August? So here's the two levels. When you do the RISE program, there'd be one teacher, generally the ballet teacher, would be sort of the lead teacher who will also be taking the course and can be part of the Q&A, would get the notification of the completion of the quizzes that everybody's doing that. If, however, you want to have me as your personal Q&A person that we have a discussion every month, and you'd have up to, say, three teachers, so you're a larger studio, all three teachers want to take it, then you'd go for the Releve program. It does have a minimum of 15 students, just so that, you know, <laughs> not three students, three teachers. <laughs> I don't think there's an, an, enough happening there. But, so those are the, the two programs. Why might you choose the Releve program? Well, if you've got a bigger studio or more than 15. If you were only looking at this as pre-point, maybe you only have a class of 10. But if you were to say, actually, my dancers who are competitive dancers and lyrical or or contemporary, and I'm going to ask them to take this as well because really it's it's about feet and legs. Then maybe you get to cross that threshold of the 15, and perhaps you've got again a big enough studio or three studio spaces, and there's three teachers that work with the majority of those students, and they all want to be involved. Great, and of course if you 
think that you want that it to be that personalized just as Zoom call for you and your teachers and your students. Then I invite you to consider that program. So here's your discount. So I had given the idea of the, the 197 a moment ago. If you have over the 20 students, it drops down to 177. And then you can see the pricing over there for the Releve program. It's just $20, $30 difference. And that's obviously reflective of the additional teachers that can be part of it and the the one-on-one -on -one scheduling of just you and your studio. And we can be looking at what a schedule needs to be. I am amenable to making it work, right? Uh, my, my schedule is open to saying, oh, you need 2 p.m.? Oh, you need 1 a.m. because you're at this time zone? That's fine, I'll make it happen. Okay. Now, up to you whether you wanna consider this optional or mandatory. Depends on your studio. For some people with a competitive program that's you know, they go and they go to the nationals and they do all this. There's sort of, you got to have your team jackets. You got to have the, you gotta, maybe you want this to be mandatory. That's up to you. And if that is the case and you've got quite a large studio where there'd be more than 440, then again, reach out and there can be an even greater discount on the price per student. So the payment options, good old PayPal, which really means it can be a studio account or a credit card. Uh, maybe you want to do it on a credit card and get points if you have one of those cards <laughs> or you can do an e-transfer if that's your preference there is the obviously it's okay to pay all at once and if you pay all at once there's a bonus workshop for your teachers or if you want to divide it into two or three equal payments you can do that depends perhaps on how you've collected from the parents as to what feels right for you so how do you decide on market value well i would just say you know for when you're thinking how much could this support my studio bottom line? Well, first of all, how many students do you think you have that would want to do this? That gives you your base number. Then you decide whether you'd want to do the RISE or Releve program, which again, might change your base number. Because it's 42 lessons, and yes, they vary in length based on being digestible and progressional. I'm not going to chop up a concept that really needed 30 minutes to fully go through but I'm also not gonna give them 30 minutes every day because I think that could overwhelm students, especially if they did them Monday to Friday. But regardless, you could look at it and say, it might be similar to as if I added one more hour class a week. So you could look and say, what's my, my yearly rate? So back when I had my studio, let's say it cost $340 for that one hour class that they divided into their monthly payments. That might give you an idea of saying, okay, so parents might be willing to pay 300 for this. And if I bought at 137 because I did the bulk, then, oh, that's quite a nice profit share. When do you need to buy? <laughs> Big question. <laughs> you can buy anytime you want. Of course. There is an early bird rate before July 31st, which could therefore either give you more profit or maybe because it's a lower price, you could ultimately maybe encourage more students to enroll, which ultimately would be more profit. The reason I would want to do the early bird one would be because there is the option of you starting in mid-August, August 14th. And that way, if there's a handful of students who wanted to get a couple of weeks in before they go back to studio, maybe they have more time. If they're not the students that are off on dance intensive, but they're willing to get back and just restart a little bit. Okay, so of course you need to be um, registered by them. So there's a greater discount. You could have the rise down to 167 or the releve down to 197 if you were to be registering by July 31st. Here's how you would present it to your teachers, or sorry, well, your teachers perhaps actually let them know you're doing this. And then the parents. I have marketing that I can provide for you. You may or may not like my flavor and how I do marketing. You may wish to do your own therefore, and that's totally fine. You may wish to do studio branding or however you want to do it. So that's up to you, but I'm here to support you. You will receive the PowerPoint as part of this so that you will have the PowerPoint slides if you're wanting to extract information from them. Okay, I want to make it as easy as possible. Easy enrollment, all I need from you is the student's name and email, and then they get an account set up in their name and email, and then they'll have access to the course, right? Your thing will be just choosing the customization whether you want the rise or the releve, and therefore also that follows into the eight week intensive, 14 week. The accountability is set up for you. You just need to decide what lead teacher to have. 
and then ideally you hop on and, and start to get a little active in the community. Just before we do that, the fun things where I give you the tidbits, transformation guaranteed. Why? Because the content's really good and it's holistic. So it's not just here, let's strengthen your ankles. It's going to be way bigger than that because maybe the kid even needs to know, well, not like why I want to strengthen my ankles, but who do I have to be to be a focused individual to actually do the work properly? The delivery of it's going to be very professional. That gives them the consistency and the learning is going to be really good. Plus they can go back and review when they need to. And then the community that also is a part of accountability, but when people feel connected in a community, especially for like reaching landmarks of like, oh yeah, I finished week four and I'm here, here's my progress. They're more engaged. Studies have shown time and time again that when we're having fun and being connected with others, we are engaged with more of our brain in the learning. So all of that is set up. Now I realize in studio, it can be that as well. So again, why is this different than in studio? Well, time and space is one of the things, but some of the content, either you or your students don't know it because you haven't done brain gym certification or reflex integration and education, or you are using the time for what studio space really is for where we don't have time to sit down and write out our goals or create a vision board. But I can show them how to do one and suggest that they do one. I can do that and I wanna do that for all these students, right? So there's, it's all set up to actually have transformation. And the bonus workshop that you would get if you were to do the one-time payment would be the start of the return to radiance course, which I started working on about six months ago. And then talking with some people, realizing that it's okay to be honest that one of the biggest stresses is the money piece. That's why I went, maybe I can create a profit sharing course. Yeah. And then the other one would be students not being motivated and parents being difficult. Like that's the stuff that just drains us. So I've got some strategies I want to share. And this course actually is one of the strategies to either avoid the burnout or return from it if you're there already. And that would be right now I'm looking at mid-August for this course so you can have time to implement some strategies before back to the, the new season, Northern Hemisphere. Kind of. Okay, so your next steps would just be deciding whether you think this is right for your studio. If you're the teacher, you talk to your studio owner, send them this um, presentation. If you're the studio owner, consider your students, your parents, and your teachers, can I do this? If you think it's yes, okay, you start marketing for the parents and students. And my suggestion would be to strive for some commitment, registration and payment by July 31st so that you can get the um, early bird discount, which again, more profit and could get them started in the program as early as that August 14th date. And that gets them sort of in the groove mentally and physically before you're back to the new season that would be really great and reach out of course if you want again any assistance with the marketing i'm not saying i'm a great marketer i've just been learning how i gotta learn <laughs> to uh, run a business you may have your own people that do it or you may be the one that does it just let me know and i'm there to help though because again it's a win-win for all of us and thank you for listening to all of this that was a lot of information but I have more of the actual practical stuff. So I'm going to stop my share. So the three um, pieces that I kind of tantalizingly said that we would be doing would be a little bit more about Achilles stripping. Why would I be holding sponges? <laughs> There's a girl holding sponges. I made her pose. And something about the navicular bone. Okay, so let me just start first with the sponges. And I've got um, sponges. So just like your typical, not a kitchen sponge, but maybe like the bigger sponge that you would use like to wash your car. I had students practicing. These were intermediate RED level students, but younger would work too, where I had them put their supporting leg on top of one sponge and then do double pits. Then I'd have them try two sponges and then three sponges. And what wonderful stuff happens is that their foot on the sponge wobbles even more. It prepares them a lot for being on a shank in a point shoe, but it wobbles them even more. It really shows them where their weight placement is. And those little tiny wobbles that are able to happen because you're on a movable surface underneath really, really heightened the proprioception. 
And for the girls doing literally just double pay devant à la seconde derrière second. So just an en croix 32 count. Their shins, like all around, nice muscle balance, were exhausted just by doing double pay standing on a few sponges because those, that little, almost like a quivering was going on as all those muscles are learning to manage the weight shifting during all those movements. So you could also use sponges. If you've got students that don't tend to put their heels down, put sponges at the front of the foot so that they have to actually actively reach against the slight lift to get the heel down or vice versa. If you've got a student that's always rolling, put a little sponge edge on the inside edge to help them to create that shift over. So sponges at home, if these are students doing the program, or there you go, you can just add sponges to your props at the studio. Okay, now for an actual hands-on, the navicular bone is one of the sort of like the key pieces, like the top keystone of the arch. And I ask students too, and I'm gonna show it, I guess I'm gonna stick my foot up on my desk. I encourage you to do this with me. All right, so the navicular bone is usually right about here. And on students whose foot structure needs to be more integrated or that they actually have flat feet, the navicular bone tends to stick out a lot, okay? And I've done this work with students for quite a while now, actually, probably about 10 years. And it's been fascinating for one student, it took, well, under three months for her navicular bone to actually recede back in. And so our bodies respond to touch in what we call neurovascular points. Okay? So all I would do is use my two fingers and just literally touch my navicular bone. I'm not touching anywhere else. I'm making it very specific for my body to just hold where the sticky outy bit would be for some students. Some students may find they don't have the sticky outy at all, which is great. I would still do this. Now, this seems suspiciously easy, but I will tell you, this came from my brain gym world and reflex world. I've done a lot of traveling where I'm like walking around for, you know, 10, 12 hours on the streets of New York or London or something, being a tourist. If I take the time to hold this spot for like two minutes before I start my day, it helps to trigger the integration of my reflex or, or sorry, integration of the arch and my feet don't get tired. If I don't do it, my feet get tired. So I encourage you to do this. So you could sit like I'm doing here, or you could sit down like in a little butterfly and hold these spots. The foot does need to be flat for you to find it. So if I was like this, with it turned out, I wouldn't find it because of the, the way the foot, the foot shapes differently, okay? So just holding that, that navicular point, it's again, suspiciously easy and yet totally effective. Okay, now one more that I did do the video, but. I was wanting to do more explanation in the course than just on the video there, was Achilles stripping. So let's say I was sitting down on the ground like you saw in the video. I'm gonna use my same arm as leg to create flex so that I'm not actively having to work the muscles too much. I'm gonna let my arm do the work. Then using my thumb and usually second and third fingers, I'm gonna go on either side of the Achilles. So they're about an inch apart. I'm not actually gonna squeeze my Achilles but I'm gonna go on either side and I'm gonna go right from the base of the heel, not into the calf muscle. And I'm sliding up and I'm gonna pull my, I'm sliding up with enough speed and pressure, kind of like a glisse, you know, I put my friction and then it pops off. Doing the same thing here. And so that I basically stop because I hit into my thigh. Okay? And I'm sliding up. My pressure is such that my, my nails would go white because I'm actually pressing. I'm not squeezing, I'm just pressing inwards as I swipe up. And I swipe up eight to 10 times. And it's like, again, a little miracle cure. We're dealing with the nervous system here and it releases all sorts of tension in here. In a way, again, where you go, but I didn't stretch. It's like, mm, tension is often the nervous system with protection. Yeah, so if you did a bunch and then just take, take a plie down and see if you actually got any deeper. And so if you didn't get deeper, A, you may not need it, or B, you might need to go a little harder, a little stronger, and maybe a few more. But I can even feel, because I just did one, that my calf muscle that I just did, it's as if I took a decongestant or something on that calf. And it's just, it feels lighter and looser, not so thick and meaty. <laughs> and, and that thick and meaty, which sometimes you go, oh, I can feel strong. Hmm, are you feeling tension? So that's one of the big pieces that I will be working on. I'm, 
really into the nervous system work uh, for learning and for gaining real strength. And before we go into the q and I'll just leave one last piece that I've learned personally in a very big way. If your nervous system is not prepared to learn, okay, the brain's not working. It's not going to work. But on a deeper level, if I've got tension blocking things, and again, my nervous system is in that fight or flight holding stuff, you could think of it like having a hole in your bucket. And all the work that we pour in to help our bodies or help our students to become stronger, most of it gets lost and poured out. So if you have students where you go, I know they're working. They are working. I can see it. And yet they're not really getting any stronger. That would be why. They have a hole in their bucket. And it's from a nervous system perspective. And that's stuff that fascinates me because I've always been willing to work hard and always been confused by how come all my hard work isn't getting me that result? And it's been a lot to do with um, well, nervous system issues. And so that's been personal experience and then the professional. And so that's what I will share as well without getting too you know, deep into it where the kids go, I have trauma, that's why I can't rise, right? <laughs> we don't want them to get into that. But to just go, let's release tension before we add strength. So that's gonna be one of the big hallmarks there. If you have questions, comments, suggestions, things where you go, you didn't say this, but we'd love that to be in the program too. I'm turning the, the floor over to those of you here live. I do have a question. Um, so if I have a group of students um, and, hey, can I have it start like when we start classes that they all start it? So yes, you can, you can choose your start date, absolutely. So if you wanted the early bird, right, let's say you still get them signed up and it's part of their yearly fees, right? They get signed up this summer for September start then yeah, start September 11th, start September 12th, start September 18th, or well, whatever day you start, yeah. Okay. The program would be ready um, as early as August 8th or August 14th if you wanted them to get ahead. But if you wanna wait till everybody's back, then yeah, just start when you wanna start. And say I have 15 students sign up, I would be able to go through the program too as the lead teacher? Yes. If you no. had the 15, you could even have three teachers go through it. Okay. Especially if there's um, more than one ballet teacher, you know, where you're team teaching in a way you would want ideally to have everybody on the same page. It'd be very weird if you're like, okay, girls, let's do our Achilles stripping to start class, which I absolutely recommend. Why not get a deeper demi plie for the whole class? <laughs> right? Why not? Um, if you do this and the students do it and then they go to the other class and the teacher's like, what? No, we're not taking time on that. No, 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 no. You wouldn't want that. You wouldn't, the, the, that conflict would be very uncomfortable for everybody. So ideally, yes, if there's more than one person teaching, it probably means you've got more students and you can have yeah, up to three teachers. I mean, reach out if you want more teachers on board. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what is the point at which you can add a teacher? How many students? The, the 15. 15, okay. 15, yeah. I mean, right now I'm creating the structure. If I'm not saying I'm going to be all bendy on my my rules or anything, but if you had 14, but you really want two teachers, then you know, just talk to me. <laughs> okay, yeah, because I don't. I want this only to enhance everybody's lives and conflict. I know what's really cool. I've been able to be um, a guest teacher, sub teacher for the most part in the last while, and for a lot of kids that you know I might see like still 10 times in a year. But I get to come in as that weird teacher who does different things. But I wouldn't want to be the weird teacher where the other teacher I'm team teaching with, we, we don't talk, we don't know the same stuff to a degree. Everybody's going to teach their own way. But if there's something that's really effective and the other person's never heard of it, doesn't believe in it, that's, like, that's awkward for everybody. So I wouldn't want that to happen. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any recommendation for how to handle it if um, a certain level of class everybody doesn't want to sign up for it, but you want to still bring it into the, the class. That's, it. That's an excellent question. So let's say you have a class of 12 and only 10 want to do it. I would say do it. And those two are going to hear about it and probably go, mom, mom, I really want to do it too. <laughs> and they're going to, you know, 
the, the thing that I don't believe can happen is it, it can't be like, oh, don't sign up. I'll just share it with you. No, it's going to be a unique password for that child's account. They won't be able to share it with anybody. Um, so yeah, I would just say do it. And if the transformation starts early enough, quick enough, or even just, you know, I'll try to throw in my really like, that's weird that that worked nuggets very early on. So that if, you know, yeah, one kid's doing the Achilles stripping, let's say in the change room before class and everybody else is like, what are you doing? It's like, well, that's that thing I learned from that new course that works really well. Then it will, it's not peer pressure. It's hopefully peer excitement, but yeah, I would totally do it. And um, really, I mean, if the teachers are learning it, ideally this becomes something that let's say this time next year, the teacher may go, I've learned it and all the exercises I'm going to, I now know them and I do them in my class. And so those two kids who didn't sign up might still get some of the same exercises because you choose to do them in class, right? The part that they would probably miss out on would be the, the personal development side of stuff, the self-reflections and goal setting and all that, that you're probably not likely to take class time. But some of the big meaty stuff, maybe they learn anyway. That, those are my questions. I do want to say one thing for anybody who hasn't um, gone through some of your things before. I'm really excited about this because I've tried to incorporate a lot of the things I've seen from your videos and stuff into class, but I can't explain them as well. And sometimes it just doesn't go over as well. But if I'm doing something like this, I think we can really get a lot of those things rolling. Um, because a few of the things we've done, the kids were like, wow. Wow, so, why did that work? That's so crazy. Yeah, yeah so thank you for I really want to say that I'm excited about this and I think it could be a fantastic thing for anybody. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, it, it's true. There is a lot of things that like there's some things they're hard work and you're going to work on that for three months to get results. And then there's lots of cool little bits where you just go, oh, oh, I, di I didn't know to work with that. And I, I think even like say the energy stuff, like maybe you did try the energy sweep or something. Yeah. And if, if you've never done that before and then you feel it and it works, it, it can be a little off-putting. You're like, what, why, what? But you know what? This day and age, actually, more so than you know, 10, 15 years ago when I was first starting it, um, people are a lot more, oh, the woo-woo is less woo-woo. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and there's a lot more science behind the woo-woo. In fact, just recently I did um, an, another, I, I redid a course with Brain Gym that I did in 2012 called the physiological basis of brain gym where they're explaining the science behind it. And I did it in 2012 because I of course wanted to know and then getting the review now, my learning got deeper and it just really settles me more to go, well, first of all, this stuff works and there is science to prove why. And there's even new science from 2012 as to proving why this stuff works. But, and, and so some kids just need to do the sweep and other kids want to know why it worked. So yeah, I'll explain that stuff. One thing I didn't put in for the content is under the balance section, I've got a lot of little tidbits for alignment of the head and shoulders in particular, so that that detailed posture, the real alignment can happen with um, less work. Again, releasing, letting the body's innate wisdom show up actually for how to truly align. So there's gonna be stuff like that in there too. It's gonna be not a full body thing, but a little bit. And before anybody asks, I'll also just say, I'm not doing the typical exercise with bands. All the typical strengthening you see for the hips and the bands and all these stuff, there's plenty of resources out that out there that are for that, that are good. This is sort of the pieces that I'm seeing that are a bit more, that are missing in my opinion. That's what I'm adding. So again, thank you, Roberta. Yeah, you're right. If you guys, I mean, heck man, you could sign into the account, your account, and we're all gonna watch this five minute video together. And then you don't even have to explain it. I, I do it for you, right? Even in class, you can do that for some of the stuff that's a bit strange <laughs> in particular. I'm available for email. I'm also available if there's a Zoom call. Uh, emails sometimes to me are great. And other times you're like, oh, for heaven's sake, can't we just talk? It'll go faster. <laughs> so re reach out if you're wanting to do just a talk and any questions that are a concern that feel a little bit more like a, a private concern that you want to share with me. So with that, I officially close our or the presentation and the Q&A. And thank you so much for those of you here live to be able to participate.
And for those of you watching the replay, I look forward to hearing from you. I'm just an email away.